Hi everyone, thank you so much for watching. My name is Raif Darazi, and today I have the distinct honor and privilege to meet with two members from AIDS Fonds. And um, we're gonna talk about the organization and what they do, and it's all related to HIV. So I'm here in Amsterdam. I was visiting for vacation to see my family. It's been over 15 years, and I, I figured while I'm here, why not do a little bit of HIV advocacy as well? Okay, so I'm gonna introduce our two fellows here. Uh, we've got Mark Fairmolen, and he is the director of AIDS Fonds since November 2018. And he holds a master's degree in business administration from Erasmus University, which is the Rotterdam School of Management. And in addition, he has a master's degree in political science and American studies obtained at the University of Amsterdam. Some of his previous experience includes working at the United Nations Development Program and the UNDP is a United Nations agency tasked with helping countries eliminate poverty and achieve sustainable economic growth and human development. Mark has been living openly with HIV since 2007, and he speaks openly about his life with HIV in order to remove the stigma and to contribute to a better understanding of people living with HIV. I can relate to that. And then we also have Remco von Leoven. Did I say that right? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> and he is the strategic advisor of AIDS funds since 2022. Remco has a medical background. After his medical studies, he started his career in HIV research in the early 90s. He worked in both academic and industry positions on drug and vaccine development. Since January 1st, he joined the Dutch AIDS funds as a strategic advisor. In that position, he helps AIDS funds to achieve one of their most important strategic goals to enable a cure for HIV infection in the future. His task is to accelerate research programming, finance from AIDS funds in the Netherlands, maintain a network and scientists, HIV practitioners, people with HIV, facilitate the national network, NL4 cure, and identify and stimulate opportunities for research financing and to cure and attract new parties to this fascinating area of research. Well, that was a mouthful for both of you. Yeah. Thank you so much Thank for you. taking the time and sitting down with me, some random bloke who messaged you and said, hey, I want to do an interview. Um, so I really appreciate it. And I know that um, the people that, that subscribe and follow my content will find a lot of value in this. I, I think so. <laughs> so I'll start with a question to you. Um, and this is a general question that I ask my interviewees. What is your current assessment of the global HIV epidemic? Um, I think it has two sides to it. Um, I always start with the positive side in the sense that if we look now at 40 years of uh, HIV, we see that uh, worldwide 75% of people living with HIV are on treatment. Uh, I think that's a fact that we celebrate too little. It's, I think, one of the main achievements in global public health of, of our generation that we were able to get so many people on treatment, something that was thought impossible only 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, at the same time, that also means that 25% of the people uh, living with HIV are not on treatment. And like you know, you need to have treatment uh, if you're living with HIV because otherwise you will become sick, acquire AIDS, and, and, uh, and die, basically. And we still know that last year, worldwide, around 650,000 people died of AIDS-related causes. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you realize that, then the glass is, is definitely not half full. That's, that's devastating that mm -hmm. after 40 years, still so many people are not acquiring the medication that they need. Uh, specifically because you know that those are the most marginalized people in, in the epidemic. So it's, it's gay men, it's uh, young people, it's sex workers, it's children uh, that are being left behind. So I think it's, it's really two sides, a lot to be proud of, but also still a lot to be done. Mm -hmm. Heard you loud and clear. So we need to acknowledge how far we've come, all the advancements that we've made, but then also recognize and realize that we still have a very long way to go. Yes, yeah, and it, it's especially because you, when you realize that <coughs> HIV is a problem now mostly because of who you are, where you live, who you love, what the color of your mm -hmm. skin is, makes a huge difference. Um, and that for me was one of the reasons to, to become active in this work is that I, I feel this solidarity with the generation before us that, that made sure that this uh, HIV medication is there. 
but also a lot of solidarity with people living with HIV that have exactly the same virus that I have, but they are not accessing that treatment because, like I said, of who they are, where they live, and that's completely unacceptable. And I do want to go into a little bit about, if you will, what brought you into the space, and, and more specifically, how you got to the point where you were brave enough to live openly with your diagnosis. Um, so my, my diagnosis is, is a while ago, so 2007. Uh, I got my diagnosis in a sort of a regular medical checkup. Uh, and so for me, it was a complete surprise and quite devastating at the time. Uh, I think a lot of the emotions that people have or might have when they get a diagnosis like HIV, like shame, how is this possible? How will I tell my family, my friends? How will people react? Did you think your life was over? I knew my life wasn't over in the sense that I knew that treatment was there, yeah. but I, it did feel a little bit like my life was over in the sense of, <clears throat> will I ever find somebody that will love me for who I am? Will, will I had, I've always found love very challenging. I've been with a partner now for many years, but especially at that time, uh, it's like finding a partner was hard sometimes. And then thinking like, oh, but like with HIV, that will become impossible. So in that sense, uh, yeah. Yeah, having challenges, but also shame uh, towards your family, like how will people react? Um, so I knew that no, my life wouldn't be over, as in here in the Netherlands, there would be treatment for me, but it did raise a lot of questions and, and insecurities. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, at, at that time, I was working in, in sort of a more political field in development. And after a year also made me realize for me, I was in that position living here in the Netherlands. Um, but I also realized that for a lot of people, especially at that time, uh, there were still so many people living with HIV not on treatment that I just wanted to do something with that. And so I started at AIDS Fonds in 2009. Uh, I've been in different capacities since then and in the last four years in the capacity of executive director. Um, and also, it, for me, it was a process to become open about that. Like in 2007, it, it, I wasn't open. I told a few of my close friends. I told my, my parents after half mm -hmm. a year. Uh, but it took me several years to become more open uh, in my work. And it took me even longer to start publicly speaking about it because there's still this questioning of what will people think? Uh, how will they react? Um, so there was yeah. this hesitation. Yeah. Yeah. And Remco, turning it over to you, uh, what was your experience living in the Netherlands, growing up in the Netherlands, as far as your perceptions of HIV and, and advancements or not being aware at all? Or what, what was that like? Well, I'm a bit older than Mark. Uh, so I had, uh, I'm, I'm a gay uh, man, so I have sex with, with, with many guys. And I had my coming out in the uh, actually in the mid-80s. Mm. Uh, and this was the time when actually the first patients of, with HIV uh, were diagnosed, um, a time where HIV was still a deadly disease. And, um, you know, although uh, I don't have HIV, fortunately at the moment, I've been at risk for 40 years. Uh, and I've seen a lot of friends die, especially in the early years. It was really a sort of gamble whether you would survive or not. Mm. Um, so for me, that has always been a, a motivation uh, to be active in the field. And uh, so I started my career in HIV uh, at a time where I think there was a lot of excitement about the fact that the antivirals that were then discovered and being tested in patients for the first time actually made a difference um, initially with some modest effect but you know when we had the opportunity to combine different antivirals with each other it became a difference of day and night so I've seen, you know, what the medical field can actually do for uh, uh, a disease that uh, used to be a deadly disease and now is for people that have access to treatment, a chronic disease that not necessarily has to influence the way that you live, right? And um, so, like Mark mentioned, we are fortunate in this part of the world. There's mm -hmm. many places in the world where people are less fortunate. Yet I do think that if you look at the medical developments in the field, there is actually that same sort of spirit again that, hey, we can make a difference here. We have been able to treat people with HIV, make sure that instead of them dying from HIV, they can live a long, healthy life. Now I think we're in an era that we have the prospect of curing people from HIV, really making sure that HIV is no longer a threat to them, even in the absence of taking antivirals. And I think that's a very exciting time. Oh, yeah. 
And on a, on a personal note, as someone who is HIV negative, and with your statement about being diagnosed and then that concern about is love possible, is a relationship possible, I know that so many people that reach out to me, DM, comment, that's one of their primary concerns when they get a diagnosis after they learn that they can continue living and being healthy is what's, what's the possibility for love. And as someone who's HIV negative, what is your perspective on that? And has that changed mm -hmm. after you've gone more into HIV research? Yeah, I've seen, you know, especially in that time where HIV was a deadly disease, obviously, you know, taking the conscious decision that you would take a relationship with somebody who's HIV positive is, is actually something that is, um, what's, the, what's the appropriate word for, for that? It's, it's actually a, a very big decision to take, mm -hmm. obviously. So I've always admired my friends who um, were HIV negative and, and, and yet because they fell in love with somebody who's HIV positive, uh, took the decision that love prevails and, and um, you know, took that step, uh, a big leap. Now, I think, although there's still stigma, uh, from a medical perspective, there's no reason why, you know, having a relationship with somebody of who's HIV should be a barrier. Yet the emotional story, of course, is a very different one. Yeah. So I think that's also a very important reason why making sure that we get this cure for HIV is something that becomes a reality for people living with HIV because if you are in that situation, then there's no reason whatsoever why that should also be an emotional barrier. Mm -hmm. At least that's, that's how I see this. Uh, again, not being HIV positive, but you know, from the perspective of, of, of having lived in the situation being risk for HIV, having friends with HIV, I think that is actually the way that I would, I would see this. Yeah. Anything you would like to add? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think a big change, of course, has been a U is U, so, yeah. so undetectable is untransmissible, and I've also experienced it at a personal level where, where in 2012, um, I still wasn't on treatment because back then we were still waiting mm -hmm. to start treatment because I wasn't sure scientifically what the long-term effects of medication were. And being at a relationship at that time with somebody that was HIV uh, negative, uh, especially after like half a year, then you sort of start realizing, okay, so every time we have sex, we have to use condoms. Um, and or when you have anal sex, you have to use condoms, but also the, always the risk that something could go wrong. And I, I remember, uh, and that was a big challenge then, and, and for several reasons that relationship didn't work out, but the, the revelation of, and the freedom that came with, with you as you, um, also for people living with HIV and for myself, so knowing that you, uh, of course, just sex without a condom, most of the time is just nicer or sexier, uh, but also, discovering that you don't have that voice in the back of your head thinking like, oh, but mm -hmm. what if the mm -hmm. condom breaks, uh, was a real liberation to uh, enjoy sex and sexuality in a different way again. So I think that definitely, hopefully for a lot of people with HIV has really changed now that we know that you're on treatment, you can't transfer the mm -hmm. virus anymore. That in addition to PrEP is that each individual can take responsibility for their own sexual yeah. health. Um, yeah, and, and, and you touch on a good point because I remember um, before my diagnosis, yes, I knew that condoms were a preventative measure. It was before PrEP was around, so that wasn't even an option. And the idea of not using a condom, that intimacy, physical intimacy, is what I felt like I got from that. And that was so mm, important to me growing up as someone who couldn't be out for a long time and didn't feel comfortable. and the self-hatred and all of that, having that intimacy was so important and needed, desperate for that, that it outweighed the fear of getting an STI or HIV. So I think that's powerful. Yeah, and I think in, in that way, um, USU has liberated a lot of people, but it also brings back a certain sex positivity and and mm -hmm. yes there's still ST, STIs out there that you can attract when when you're on prep but it gives you the liberty to choose 
how to love and be intimate, but also to enjoy sex yeah. and and to have that conversation again in in for example the community of gay men after so many years of fear uh, that was surrounding H because of HIV was surrounding sex and sexual pleasure mm. to be able to discuss yeah. sex positivity again and to enjoy sex without that fear is is I think a great thing and like Remco was saying I think it like cure and HIV cure and the whole research into that will hopefully just like USU at, at one point in time bring that next level of taking away fear but also stigma that that's still surrounding mm -hmm. HIV. Totally and big shout out to Bruce Richmond for being the standard bearer for the U equals U movement. Um, is that something that's widely accepted in the Netherlands or generally known about? Um, I think in the gay community uh, it is well known uh, and people accept it and, and celebrate it. Uh, I think every microphone that I get uh, under my nose, I, I try to get you as you into the message mm -hmm. uh, or in the story that we're telling because I'm always surprised with how many people uh, haven't mm -hmm. heard that news. So I think it is something that all of us in this field, and you were talking about HIV advocacy, you should work it into any conversation because I think we've missed big headlines and a lot of people might have heard about it but not really registered it. Uh, and I, I do think it takes away from some of the stigma around HIV. So if you're talking about HIV, uh, work in USU into your messaging because I think we can't tell it enough. Absolutely. And so speaking of the, the Netherlands, um, how do you, what do you feel that the progress is as far as HIV, transmissions, getting access to care, um, continuing to live healthy, vibrant lives? I'll open it to both of you. Yeah, you wanna is there pro and also if you want to touch on, um, has the pandemic had an effect? Uh, let's start by, by, by that you is you message and um, you know the importance of, of bringing that message across. So you're here for, for King's Day. Uh, I was at the party uh, last Sunday uh, where um, usually in the doka there were always signs about take care of HIV, there were condoms. Uh, this time I saw nothing. Um, so you know I think despite the fact that I think we take for granted that there's no more preventive measures, I think we shouldn't lose track of the fact that you have to be vocal about the fact that people need to protect themselves, whether that's with, with PrEP or with condoms, doesn't matter. But the total absence of that message was not a good sign, mm -hmm. I thought. Um, the second thing that we have here in the Netherlands, which I think is true for a lot of uh, European countries, is that there are more and more people on PrEP, but access to PrEP is still limited. Uh, and that's, I think, for a rich country like the Netherlands, a shame. We know that PrEP is highly effective. It works in 99% of, uh, of all people who take, take PrEP. So it's, an, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge step in controlling uh, HIV. So we have a lot of people on the waiting list here, and that's unnecessary. Uh, a rich country like the Netherlands should be able to arrange that. Um, so there's... Is that a lack of the, <coughs> the medicine itself, or...? administrative problems or wh how, why is there a backlog? It's a not a lot of a lack of medicines. It's not a matter of cost, I would say. Uh, we spent like 100 billion in this country on healthcare. The, the, you know, the, the, the fraction that we spent on PrEP programs is neglectable. Uh, but I think it's the bureaucracy uh, that actually prevents systems to be really flex flexible. Mm. Um, so as an organization, uh, you know, we want to be, uh, we want to make sure that that discussion is is not not forgotten. Um, and um, coming back to your question, what what is the difference now? Again, I came from from a, 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 a time period where where HIV was a deadly disease. We have made a huge progress, but we're still not there yet. Yeah, it's so striking to me that a country that I would consider to be an ideal place where, you know, healthcare and government and um, community can all come together and understand the epidemic. And really you have the backing, you have the social backing and the support to still have such a struggle with something so basic as access to, to prep. It, it's, I mean, there are so many great things about the Netherlands in that respect, but 
gosh, then I'm like these other countries that have all these hur other hurdles, government, social, otherwise, how, <laughs> how do we get them to where we want to be when it's, it's a struggle here even? Yeah, from my perspective, healthcare is, is really a difficult, uh, uh, difficult industry, difficult s sector to work in. Um, you know, if you would be the, the minister of health in a Western country, typically what you would fear is the fact that we're all getting older. Uh, you know, we're consuming a lot more health care. It's getting costier. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's not keeping pace with our, 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 our growth of the, of the national product. Uh, so there's a lot of, yeah. So there's a lot of things that you have to take care of, and I can perfectly see that you know in the grand scheme of things, this might not be at the highest priority level from a minister of health. And yet at the at the same time, this is something that is so simple to uh, solve compared to all the other problems. So I think you know it 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 should be solved. It can be solved. Yeah. And I think it will take organizations like us and others to make sure that we continue with telling that story, not only here in the Netherlands, but especially also for people living in low and middle income countries. Like Mark mentioned, you know, we're on the right track here in this part of the world. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, since COVID, we have seen a, uh, a rise again in the number of new HIV infections. And that's mm -hmm. a very challenging situation, which hasn't... Uh, which hasn't changed now that COVID is away. Yeah. So I want to touch on this other topic now. So Mark was program manager for the International Human Rights Program, Bridging the Gaps. Since 2015, it has been one of the largest programs worldwide that is committed to the health and rights of the most marginalized groups in the fight against AIDS. So my question is, what were some critical needs that you discovered during that time in the marginalized groups? And is that domestic, international, both? Um, so this program was funded by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we're now actually continuing that program with, with what we call the Love Alliance. Um, and uh, that's focusing now mostly on the African region. Um, and I think what, you, what we've learned there, what we saw there, uh, is that um, HIV, again, like I shared in the beginning, is mostly hitting people that are marginalized for one way or the other. We now know that since last year, 70%, so 70% of new infections worldwide uh, are among these what we call key populations. So these are LGBTI people, sex workers, drug users. So that's uh, those groups together form a, f a small fragment of the total population worldwide. But Yet again, they form 70% of new HIV infections. So if we're, if we're wanting to address HIV and, and reach a world where, where nobody dies of AIDS, we have to work with these groups. And that's what we started doing back in 2015. Uh, I think one of the things that we learned that was most important is that you have to work with these groups together. I think one of the building blocks of the HIV movement from the very early beginnings was nothing about us without us. Um, if you talk, sometimes you hear people talking about hard to reach groups. Um, no group is hard to reach if you're working with the people in that group because they know who their community is, they know what their community needs, where they are, and how you can reach them. And I think for us that meant working with community-led organizations in all these countries, so with, uh, with gay men's organizations, with sex worker organizations, with people using drug organizations, putting them in the driver's seat, asking them what they need, um, and also willing to invest in that because I think for a lot of these groups, especially in, in lower and middle income settings, um, HIV is not in their top three problems. Their, their number one problem is, will I have a meal tomorrow? Where will I have a roof over my head uh, next month? Um, how do I take care of my children? So mm -hmm. only by addressing those needs uh, and having what we call sort of a holistic approach, uh, you can also start addressing their needs. So I think the nothing about us without us was really also in that sense coming out. Um, uh, and if you talk to people, it's also mostly about their human rights position. So if you're marginalized, if you're criminalized because of who you are, uh, what we're seeing happening in Uganda now, um, you cannot address uh, the HIV crisis among, for example, gay men, if you know that there's a penalty, uh, a prison penalty yeah. on being gay, you will not reach that group. So uh, the second thing that we really learn is putting the rights central to these groups is crucial to get better health outcomes and, and ending HIV. 
So you're talking about the direct connection between uh, the rights of LGBTQ, et cetera, and being able to stop the HIV yeah, epidemic. Yeah, there's, there's no way. And I think UNAIDS is also <laughs> leading in that sense. But um, we, like Remco said, we have made this huge progress in, in HIV medication. That medication is available, uh, condoms are available, testing is available by just a prick in your finger. Uh, all these things are also available in the countries or mostly available in the countries mm -hmm. where this problem is. But if you look at a country like Russia, um, where you cannot give any health um, uh, information to gay men at all, um, how can you expect them mm -hmm. to protect themselves against HIV if they cannot even inform themselves about mm -hmm. HIV? If they go to a doctor, they get the message, we don't have treatment for people like you. That's uh, not a medical issue. That's a human rights issue. And then even back home, even in the U.S., now we're seeing a lot of rights being rolled back. Yes. With legislation, yeah. which is Especially among frightening. trans people, yeah. And then you see that the funding for specifically for HIV um, treatment is being fund is funneled away from marginalized <laughs> groups and only going towards, you know, female mothers, or for an example. And so it's, they're using that as an, a way to attack marginalized groups also. Yeah, I think we did a study a couple of years ago looking at the global HIV funding landscape uh, where we found that 4% of HIV funding is actually going to key populations, uh, while again, 70% of new infections is among key populations. Wow. So, so where's the rest? The rest of the funding is, is going to other groups that are also being hit. So young people, women, uh, mm -hmm. children. Uh, and again, that's I, I think we should really avoid as a movement to being played out against one another. So my point at in no means would be to uh, fund other groups less. Mm -hmm. There should be more funding available and the money should be data driven. Where mm -hmm. are the people with the highest risk? Which approaches are best working? And those should be implemented. And if you proportionate, um, but also fully funded. Um, and th I think that's another mm -hmm. problem. Uh, if you look at the global HIV response, um, international donors are, are pulling away. Um, most countries are, are carrying a larger burden of the HIV uh, costs themselves, which is great, but that's stagnating mm -hmm. um, and the epidemic keeps growing. So there's, there's a big problem. We should look at the division of funding for HIV but also acknowledge that more funding for HIV uh, is needed if we really want to end the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so AIDS Funds has three main strategic goals. My understanding is one, no new HIV infections, two, sexual health, sexual rights, and three, HIV cure. So keeping in mind the things that we've been discussing and the issues, how is AIDS Funds helping towards that goal? Yeah, so I think our, our overall mission as AIDS Fonds is working towards a world where everybody is, is free to love fearlessly. Uh, and that means without stigma, without fear for, for HIV or STIs. Um, and these goals that you describe are sort of our aspirational goals. So that's what we're really working towards. I don't expect us to have a world in four years where everybody can enjoy their sexual health, but that is what keeps us going. That's mm -hmm. what make, keeps, wakes me up in the morning and that's what we go with, when the thought that we go with uh, to sleep at night. Um, I think it basically means addressing the pandemic. So first of all, making sure that people uh, have the, the space and the opportunity not to acquire HIV or STIs. If they do, that they have the means to treat themselves and keep themselves healthy and alive. Uh, and I think the final goal, like you said, which we added, um, I think five or six years ago, is really coming to terms, and I think Remco mentioned it at the, at the beginning of the conversation, is that in the field of HIV, we've, we've um, been so happy with the, the developments in the field of treatment that we sort of came to accept that as sort of the end point. There's treatment now, so that's great. Well, at the same time, if you look at a lot of other diseases, treatment is great, but you want to be cured. Um, mm -hmm. And I think also in polling and, and research among people living with HIV, uh, especially young people living with HIV, cure is really something that um, is desired because it takes away the burden of taking your pills every day. It takes away the uncertainty of will there be medication for me half a year from now or mm -hmm. next month. 
but it will also take away uh, the stigma that people are still, uh, even if you're on treatment, you're still living with HIV or you're a person with HIV and an HIV cure will hopefully take that away. Yeah. And, uh, and well, perhaps we'll talk about that, but that, that's still far off. We know that HIV cure won't be available tomorrow, but we felt as AIDS funds is that we need to invest there to make sure that uh, the research takes place in the field of HIV cure, but also there we see our role or our niche basically to make sure that also here it's nothing about us without us. So that HIV cure is not just something that scientists do, which it, they play a hugely important role, especially in this phase, but also now already people living with HIV are involved in determining what kind of cure would be acceptable, mm -hmm. um, what do they need from, from an HIV cure, uh, and not just for uh, people living with HIV in the Netherlands, but for people living with HIV everywhere in the world. And if you consider that there's 38 million people living with HIV, mm -hmm. most of them on the African continent, we also need to have communities living with HIV there involved in cure research. So that's what we hope to bring to the table as AIDS funds, as, as part of our strategy. Very good. And uh, uh, Remco, I'll, I'll take it to you a little bit too, um, speaking on HIV cure research. Can you talk about fast track cities and what that means for the Netherlands and what AIDS funds role is in that? Well, fast track cities is a very important initiative uh, and it's an initiative which is more towards bringing that number of HIV infections down to zero by making sure that you know the prevention that people need is actually available. So making sure there's PrEP, there's, there's, there's condoms, there's other methods to prevent HIV infection. And so fast track cities is actually collaboration between cities all over the world mm -hmm. to make sure that programs are implemented to make that happen. Um, so for us as the ACE funds, uh, finding a cure for HIV, as, as Mark mentioned, is that next dot on the horizon. And, um, you know, I think what is actually quite unique about AIDS funds as a, as a health foundation and, 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 and sort of a sort of more activistic type of NGO organization is to actually uh, put this in wording in the strategy. And for me, that was a motivation to start working uh, at AIDS funds. So, you know, I explained that I started my career in the, in the, in the 90s. Um, with the uh, studies on HIV treatment at the time. I feel that there's similar excitement now on the possibilities that have been uh, sort of on the horizon on the medical field. And especially if you look at advances in oncology, uh, which is actually, if you look at the biomedical field, most of the new developments are happening in oncology. So you can learn a lot from what we have learned, how we can fight and cure Can you explain cure on cancer. Oncolo oncology yeah. for those? So oncology is the medical term, a broad, broad term for people who suffer from cancer. And cancer mm -hmm. is, at least in this part of the world, still the most common uh, cause for, 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 uh, for death. Um, so if you look at... For example, the uh, last 10 years, how the engineering of our immune system, and that sounds very futuristic, but what we actually have been able to do in a very safe manner is actually take out cells from patients, treat them outside the body, and then give them back to patients. Then they're sort of uh, weaponized against the cancer that uh, you have in your body. So they automatically start attacking the cancer that you have in your body. Um, those developments uh, look very promising now for other disease areas as well. So there are already uh, trials out there where people with autoimmune diseases are treated with these sort of, uh, of, uh, um, of, 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 of new medical interventions. And we're very convinced that this is very promising for HIV as well. It's not there tomorrow, like Mark mentioned. Uh, this is uh, still a dot on the horizon. Um, I often explain the way that we get there as a journey. And I take the journey, how we got to HIV treatment today as an example. Um, when I started my medical career, um, vividly remember just after King's Day in 1989, so that's mm -hmm. now a very long time a year, a year ago. But uh, we had at that, point, at that point in time just one HIV drug on the market. AZT, and there were a couple of new ones that were investigated, and which, in combination, led to a very effective treatment. Yet, when that was brought to patients in 1996, 
this was still very complicated regimen. So I vividly remember 12 pills. Sometimes you had to take pills on an empty stomach. Others you had to take on a full mm. stomach. It was just, you know, it was a day job to take your HIV medication, as a matter of speak. We managed then to combine it into one pill. The side effects became less. Um, now we have, 30 years later, injectables that you have only to take once every two months. We have further uh, developments which may lead into an injection that you only have to take once every six months or so. So from a functional perspective, this already comes very close to a cure. So if we mm -hmm. talk about the cure, what we actually mean by that is that you have HIV in your body, you stop taking antivirals, and when on the normal circumstances, the HIV would come back and would make you again at risk of becoming sick from HIV or make makes that you have a risk of transmitting HIV. If you have a cure strategy, it can actually mean that you are off antivirals for a longer time and yet you have no risk of becoming sick, yet no risk of transmitting the virus. Those are two very important points mm -hmm. Of, uh, of what the cure strategy is. And if you would be able to uh, achieve that with injectable therapies that you only take every six months, it is already something that comes close to what a functional cure could be. Mm -hmm. My prediction would be, the next step after that would be that you would have strategies where in combination, so probably some pills that target the virus, some pills that are more targeted towards your immune system. Mm -hmm. You can maybe ARV, ART free for a period of two years. So that will be a longer, longer period. Exactly. I protect it with just with antivirals. The regimens will become more simple, more easy to mm -hmm. administer. And our dream is that eventually the cure of HIV will be a single shot that will cure everybody. Are we there in 10 years? I don't think so, but you know, for the next 20 or 30 years, that is a very realistic outlook. Mark, I'm really glad that you mentioned um, meeting with community in this search for HIV cure and how important that is because I'm, I'm a co-chair, I'm on the community advisory board working with HIV scientists and researchers in the US. And um, that is something that we stress is that there needs to be communication between the science, the research and community. Um, what good is a cure if it doesn't meet the actual needs of people who are living with HIV. And then you mentioned the engineering aspect of, of a potential cure. And immediately, you know, you think of the sci-fi, these scary doomsday, you know, storylines of what happens with medication going out of control. And, and that just underscores the importance of having that constant communication and connection and really trust with healthcare and science community so I'm really glad that that's an emphasis for AIDS funds moving forward. And it's, it's heartening to know that not just in the US, but elsewhere, that's also a mission. No, and I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, I think it makes it challenging for HIV cure because I think for a lot of us, um, the current HIV treatment is, 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 has a very high quality and a high quality of life. Mm -hmm. So any form of cure needs to m match that or to be even be better. And it's, it's really different if you look at, like Hemko mentioned, cancer. There's, of course, in cancer treatment, often there is no other option. Like it's either um, you, will, you will die or you can take a form of treatment. And then, of course, your, your reference or the scenarios you're looking at as a patient are completely different from if you are on a chronic disease with a good quality of life. So I think... Uh, yes, we need to be involved and we need to be uh, helping out to see what is it that we really need. And I think trust is a big, big uh, issue there as well. If we look at COVID and we saw how happy we were that a vaccine was developed, but then how many people had distrust in whether or not it would work um, in my country, but also in, in the African region, we saw there was a lot of um, skepticism around is this really working is it safe so I think we should also really learn from that experience and not just focus on having a form of cure available but working with communities so that there's a good sense of understanding what it is how it works uh, that there's community leadership that also supports the form of cure that could become available so that it's uh, readily acceptable also to, for our community mm -hmm. and not something that we need to start explaining once it's there. Exactly. Well said.
want something to add? Yeah, maybe something to add. I think this is a general trend uh, that you know is true for all areas of medicines. Our interventions are becoming more, you mentioned the word, uh, uh, sci-fi. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a lot more explaining to do. And uh, I think also for HIV cure, our storytelling is just a more complicated task than it is for HIV treatment. People know what a disease is, what a virus is, people know what a medicine is, and they can make a relation that if you take a medicine, uh, it will probably inhibit the virus and therefore you won't get sick. The storytelling with HIV cure is, is a very more complicated one. And it's also more a two-way street, so it's us telling uh, people who who take an HIV cure, what to expect, what not to expect. It's also us learning from, you know, what are the needs, what mm. what can we do to make that uh, cure strategy acceptable to everybody, because only if it's acceptable yeah. to everybody, it will work. Um, the last thing I want to say about this is that there's no single infectious disease that is actually eliminated by a single intervention. It's always a combination of different things. So the way that I look at the cure strategy is that it's an extra option that people have. Mm -hmm. If you're satisfied with your daily antivirals and you know you don't have side effects, there's no reason why you need to take a cure. So mm -hmm. it's not a mandatory thing. It's an extra thing in the armamentarium that we have to you know to eventually solve the epidemic. Mm -hmm. I'm smiling as you say that because I couldn't agree more. And 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 um, when you mentioned um, a, as an option, you know. Even just thinking about the extended release ARVs, I, I did a video and I was talking about it too. And from, from my personal needs, you know, taking a pill once a day every day is easy for me because I take supplements every day. So it's just another, what's, what's an, uh, one other pill on top of, you know, 15 to 20 pills that I take for bodybuilding and fitness and general health um, versus having to schedule an appointment with a doctor every month, two months, having to go in and having an extremely busy schedule, and then that's, for me, more of a burden than it is of a health at this point. So it's definitely not a given that a, a new you know, medication or a new way of taking medication is gonna suddenly be acceptable to the community, and that people have different needs that we don't even know in, unless we have those conversations. So. No, this is so true, and there's always there's individual health, there's public health. Uh, from an individual health point of view, it needs to be an option. Um, and and uh, I think whatever form of cure strategies we design, it will always be that option. From a public health point of view, mm -hmm. looking at the number of HIV infections going up in the world, this is a must-have to make sure that eventually we curb the epidemic. So there's two different mm -hmm. different sides here. Yeah. Um, where do you both see AIDS funds having an impact? Moving forward in the next few years, in the next decade, even, what does that look like? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm bringing the ship into shore a little bit. We're, we're coming up on the hour, and I don't want to keep you all. Yeah, I, I think a lot is happening now. I, th I think there's a few things that, that, like I said, we have we have a mission and we have some dream goals. I, I think one of those things that that gets me really excited, which is, which is more national thing. I, I do think we we discussed in the Netherlands. A little bit there are some challenges here but at the same time we see that we're moving towards less than 100 HIV infections a year in the country um, which makes us one of the first countries on track to really move towards zero new HIV infections mm -hmm. I think that will be a great thing for the people living in the Netherlands uh, but I think it could also serve as an example to really showcase that if you have your policies in order, which we don't always have in the Netherlands, but we're pushing for that, mm -hmm. uh, that you can actually really end the epidemic. So I think that's really one of the things that we're focusing on. Uh, I think the other thing that um, will keep us busy in the sense is that, um, is that human rights perspective that we mm -hmm. talked about. We see that in a lot of the countries where we work, we're working with these community organizations, we're actually seeing a pushback. We know that in more than 40 countries around the world, the HIV epidemic is growing. The number of new HIV mm -hmm. infections are growing despite all the medical advancements we've discussed. Uh, and that's because people are criminalized, people are discriminated, uh, people are not able to access their funding. So I think we're looking at a world where HIV, and that's already the case in many instances, is, is more and more becoming a human rights issue uh, with a very strong health focus than the other way around. And that also means for our organization to 
uh, focus more and more on that kind of, of work. And then finally, I think, is, is really the, the dream that we've described in uh, contributing uh, to an HIV cure. That will never be something that we will do as AIDS forms. That will be a huge collaboration of scientists and communities around the world, mm -hmm. uh, mobilizing the funding needed, uh, the scientific brain power behind it. But I really hope that as AIDS forms we can um, contribute to all those aspects, but mostly also to the fact that we, we need that nothing about us without us also an HIV cure, and not when the cure is ready, but from yesterday, basically. And I think that's what something that we'll keep pushing for to hopefully eventually make a form of cure available for everyone everywhere living with HIV if they choose to be cured. Okay, that's exciting and hopeful. And is there anything that we haven't discussed today or you would like to share, touch on for you personally or the organization? Well, maybe, you know, to touch upon what Mark just mentioned, you know, sometimes we have these strategy sessions and we ask ourselves the question, are we still in business in, in, in 10 years time? And then we say to each other, hopefully not. Uh, but yeah. if I look at uh, one of our partner organizations, the Keynes V, that's the Dutch uh, tuberculosis uh, foundation. Uh, so mm -hmm. tuberculosis has been a disease where, you know, we also have seen in the 1950s actually quite a dramatic change with the introduction of antimicrobials at the time. Um, it became from an endemic disease in this country to something that is still uh, uh, occurring, but on an incidental basis, and mostly is an import disease. Yet the Keynes V, established in 1904, is still establishing and thriving as an organization, especially because there's still a very big global challenge. Uh, globally, it's still the most uh, prevalent infectious diseases uh, where people die from. So, um, you know, I think it, you have to be in there for the long run, especially if you look at the inter inter international aspects, things don't change all overnight. Mm. And so for me, you know, it's a very exciting time to work at AIDS funds because of all the developments in the field and what we can do uh, with HIV cure. But, um, you know, I think that you have to really see that as a journey. The starting point and something that maybe looks like a first version of HIV cure, maybe around the horizon, but the end game, a single shot where everybody can be cured without any side effects, that is actually still a long journey. Okay. Where can folks go to either follow you and or the organization? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can go to aidsfunds.org for our, our international site. Uh, you can follow me on, on Twitter, uh, Mark Vermeule AF. Um, and on Instagram and all the social media channels, you, you'll find them online. Okay. Um, and yeah, really excited if people want to do that. And is there anything that folks can do to support? Yeah, I think it, it's great, and especially for, for people uh, outside of the Netherlands to, to follow our work, to be vocal about uh, what we need from a community of people living with HIV, so to participate in online discussions, uh, to make yourself vocal against the pushback movement that we're seeing. Uh, you discussed the, the pushback in the U.S., but mm -hmm. also in Uganda. Make your voice heard that this is not acceptable. Uh, and of course, we're a fundraising organization, so if people want to fund our work or participate uh, with a financial contribution, please be in touch, mm -hmm. and we're always very happy to talk to you. Well, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating conversation. I feel like we've just barely scratched the surface of a lot of very interesting topics. Um, I would, I'm sure people are gonna have questions, comments, um, after watching this video. I would love to follow up with either of you, sure. both of you, in the months to come, and and just keep following your journey. Thank you, and thanks for your, your time. Really yeah, appreciate thank you both. Thank you. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed this uh, interview. Please like this video if you liked it, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit that bell so that you get a notification every time a new video is posted, and I will see you guys soon. Cheers.